tonight, we're going to be exploring the parting of ways between Judaism and Christianity. I think it's safe to say that today, Judaism and Christianity are two different, distinct religions, two world religions that have their own faith system and faith structure. They have their own list of beliefs that they adhere to. And we want to go back and explore how this parting of ways actually occurred. You see, 2,000 years ago, if you walk into Jerusalem and you bump into a follower of Jesus, what is, what's the first thing you know about that person? That he's Jewish. That's the first obvious thing we know about a follower of Jesus, of Jesus 2,000 years, years ago. And so we want to understand that if the, um, the origins of this group, if the origins of this Christian faith started out in Jerusalem, started out in the land of Israel, started out within the Jewish community, how did it go so far? to become something that is no longer recognizable as part of the Jewish faith. Now, in order to um, discover this, what we really would like to have are multiple sources of accurate information about this group. And the question is, where can we go to find it? Well, unfortunately, there are not many sources that we can go to, and so therefore, it's important for me to point out that this whole presentation tonight is speculative, which means to say that not all the details are ironed out and not all the things we can swear to are 100% accurate. But what we will try to do tonight is present a plausible um, explanation as to what might have happened um, throughout the history of the church. So. Throughout Jewish history, generally speaking, the Jewish community viewed Jesus and his followers as being people who broke away from Judaism, started their own religion, and therefore we have nothing to do with them. Where do Jewish people get this idea from? Well, one of the places that could be argued that this idea was taken from are from references in the Talmud. Historically, we know that people within the church accused Jews of disrespecting Christianity, disrespecting Jesus, the founder of Christianity, by making derogatory references to him in the Talmud. And it's because of that, many cartloads of the Talmud were burned publicly because of this. And so, there are references in the Talmud. In your reference sheet here, you'll see I've referenced about five of them. There may be one more, maybe six of them, um, which refer to an individual who's known as either Yeshu or referred to as Ben Stada. That's the person referred to. And it has been pointed out that there are some slight similarities between the character that's mentioned in the Talmud and the character of Jesus. However, many people have pointed out that there are serious discrepancies between these references and what we know about Jesus of the New Testament. For example, there's a problem with the dating. The Yeshu that is referred to in the Talmud is someone who lived in the time of Rabbi Shur ben Parachia, who was about a hundred years prior to the time of Jesus of the New Testament, or to someone who actually lived a hundred to 150 years after the time of the Jesus of the New Testament. And so therefore, there are automatically problems right there with the time, with the timing. Some Jewish sources argue that in fact it's the Christians that have the wrong dating, and we have the right dating in the sense that they believe that the views that are held about Jesus 
being someone who went and rebelled against Judaism and went to worship idols, that's the true story of Jesus, and the story in the Gospels are not true, and they're confused. However, other people point out that besides the name Yeshu, there's very little else within the context of these stories that seem to line up with Jesus. So, for example, one of the things that's mentioned in the Talmud is that this person, Yeshu, had five students. Now, we know from the Gospels that he had 12 disciples, the 12 apostle, apostles. Um, it speaks about this person having a mother named uh, Mary, uh, the one who is the hairdresser, Megadla Nashaya. Now, we know that Mary Magdalene was not his mother. And so there are a number of things that lead us to suspect that perhaps they're not one and the same person. However, we must leave it open as a possibility. Perhaps it is the same person. But if we are going to say it's the same person, and if we are going to say that Jesus was just a rebel, someone who abandoned his Judaism and started a new religion, well then that would be the end of tonight's presentation. Because then we know where the break started. It started with Jesus, he came along, started a new religion, completely different to Judaism, and that's the end of the story. However, there is so much within the New Testament and what we know about the early, follower, early followers of Jesus from sources outside of the New Testament that ask us to re-examine and to see whether perhaps there's more to the story. And that's what we want to look at tonight. I have a quote here in the second uh, reference that, on your sheets from a, a, a rabbi named Rabbi Yaakov Emden. He was a great rabbi that lived in the 17th or 18th century. And uh, he wrote that we should actually have another look and see that really Jesus wasn't somebody who came to teach about the abrogation of the Torah and that people should renounce their Judaism, but in fact, he came to teach that we should follow the Torah and we should follow the laws of the Torah. So here, I'll read to you. Therefore, you must realize and accept the truth from he who speaks it, that we see clearly here that the Nazarene and his apostles did not wish to destroy the Torah from Israel, God forbid. For it is written, it, for it is written so in Matthew, Chapter 5, verse 17. The Nazarene having said, do not suppose that I have come to abolish the Torah. And then he goes on to say, it is therefore exceedingly clear that the Nazarene never dreamt of nullifying the Torah. So here we have from a very respected Jewish rabbi that lived about 300 years ago, who was of the opinion that Jesus didn't depart from Judaism and start another religion, but actually came to fortify the religion, to fortify Judaism. Now, there are references that people will look to in the New Testament, which seem to imply that actually Jesus was constantly fighting with the Pharisees. And so therefore they suggest that we see from this that Jesus opposed Judaism. He kept on pointing out the hypocrisy of the Pharisees that he was engaging and was lamenting against how the Pharisees of that time seemed to have lost the way. And what he wanted to do is bring people away from these Pharisees and to something new that he was trying to introduce. However, if a person takes a little bit of a closer look, we'll find that it's not so simple. I have over here in, um, point number three from Luke chapter 13, verse 31, where we're told that when Herod was running after Jesus to, uh, excuse me, not Herod, but uh, the Romans were looking for Jesus to kill him, some of the Pharisees came up saying to him, go away and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. So, I'm sorry, it was Herod. Um, what this intimates is that the Pharisees actually had a decent relationship with Jesus, and they had no intention of him being killed. As far as they 
um, are concerned. If someone is out to kill Jesus, we've got to warn him for, about this, and we've got to ask, you know, give him time to run away. In Matthew chapter 23, we, we read what Jesus says to his followers. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Now, what Jesus is saying over here is that as far as he's concerned, it is the Pharisees, meaning the rabbis of the day, that really sit in Moses' seat, sit in a place of authority. And so therefore, if you want to know what God wants from you, you should follow the teachings of the rabbis. Clearly, this is not something that somebody who believes that the rabbis have got it all wrong and are teaching uh, false doctrine, it's not something he would say. He manages to get in a backhanded slap over here at the Pharisees, saying that, look, while they're teaching right doctrine, but they're not practicing what they preach. And one could say that that's actually quite common to hear rabbis quabble amongst themselves and, you know, <laughs> accuse each other of being hypocrites. But nevertheless, they don't believe that people are out to teach uh, false doctrine. And so therefore, what these passages within the Gospels themselves seem to intimate is that Jesus actually was um, in line with the Pharisees and just had certain disagreements with them, which is quite normal for his day. What we know from the Gospels, and the reason why we're using the Gospels tonight is because really when we speak about Jesus, the person of Jesus, there are no other sources to really go to to tell us anything about his life. Yes, you can go to Josephus and read a small obscure passage that may have been forged, may not have been forged, but even that passage doesn't tell you much about his life. So if you want to go back and discover anything about Jesus, you can go to the Talmud, as we mentioned, and there also you're not going to find much about him, if those refer to him. Or you can go to outside sources which come up with nothing, or you can go to the Gospels. And so what we'll have to do is go to the Gospels and try and piece together whatever we can from there. So the story in the Gospels are basically like this. There's a man named Jesus who's born in a time when there's a brutal occupation of the Roman Empire that have um, occupied Judea and the life of the Jewish people is becoming increasing, increasingly more difficult, especially when it comes to religious observance. Because some of the Roman uh, procurators were actually quite mean and they did everything they possibly could to offend Jewish sensibilities. And so people were hoping and waiting for God to intervene as he has in the past and to bring about redemption, to free them from these oppressors as he has done in the past. And so within this context, a man shows up. His name is Yeshua, Jesus, whatever it might have been. And he manages to gather together a group of followers who really like what he is teaching. Now, what is he teaching? What is Jesus teaching at this time? At this time, the most common teaching of Jesus is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does he mean when he says the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven refers to a time when God's will is not only done in heaven, but it's also done on earth. And so when he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that's another way of saying that the messianic era is about to come. It's about to happen. Well, that's good to know. And what do we need to do about it? Well, Jesus tells his followers, repent. You need to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the truth is, this is not just Jesus's message, but this is a message of John the Baptist that came before him. The same idea, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and what we need to do is we need to repent. Is there anything wrong with that message? I don't think so. It sounds like a very Jewish message to me, that the Messiah can come at any moment, and we believe with sincere and complete faith in the coming faith 
in the coming of the Messiah, and that he can come at any moment, and that we can actually have a hand in making him come by repenting, by preparing the world for that age. So far, so good. And in fact, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 16, that's in reference 5 over here, he turns to his followers and he says, who do you say I am? In other words, who do you think I, Jesus, am? And Peter answers, Simon Peter, Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That's what Peter answers. Now, the question is, what does that mean? What does it mean when we say that somebody is identified as the Messiah? What would that have meant 2,000 years ago? Well, let's remember, this is before Jesus was crucified. This is before the alleged resurrection. This is before all of this. And so, in fact, what we find in this chapter, in Matthew chapter 16, is that when Jesus tells Peter that he has to go to Jerusalem and he has to suffer and die, Peter says, far be it from you. That, that should never happen to you. So Peter seems to be completely surprised by the notion that a Messiah is going to die. Well, if you were living 2,000 years ago, and there was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and there were none of the epistles of Paul, where would you get your information about the Messiah? Well, probably you'd get it from the Jewish scriptures. And what do the Jewish scriptures tell us about a future anointed king? What does it tell us? So what I have over here, I've done, and again, this is not really what we're going to delve into tonight about the differences between the Jewish uh, idea of the Messiah and the Christian idea of the Messiah, although we will go through it, but briefly. Um, but what I want to do is I, I want to go through some of these references quickly, okay? We have in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17 to 19, passages which are actually part of the prophecy of the non-Jewish prophet, Bilam which describe a military victory that's going to be brought by this leader that's going to come in the future. Isaiah 11 verses 1 to 9 speaks about a leader that's imbued with the spirit of God, wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, and fear of God. And we're told that he will be a righteous judge and he will smite the wicked dead. Again, these are passages that you can go back at home and look at, at in depth and see entire chapters which speak about a portrait of about a leader that's going to be living and ruling at a particular time. We have over here in Isaiah chapter 23 verse 5 through 8 speaking about a king who executes justice and charity and that there will be security for Israel in his days. You have in Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 23 through 31 a shepherd and a prince during a time of peace, security and bounty. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 22 through 28, speaks about this future leader. In the context of the temple being rebuilt, Israel's reconciliation with God, the ingathering of exile, observance of the law, etc. This is where the followers of Jesus would have gone to get their notion of the Messiah. And what they were hoping for is that this Jesus, living 2,000 years ago, to be that leader, to be that righteous leader that's going to come and bring in this era of peace, remove all those people that fight against God, remove them from the land of Israel, and ultimately bring everybody back to unity and worshiping God together. They believed that this was going to happen in their lifetime. That's really important to understand. The followers of Jesus did not assume that Jesus was going to die and come back 2,000 years later. That's not what they were hoping for. They anticipated an immediate arrival of this messianic era that was going to be ushered in through Jesus. And so in Matthew tw chapter 16, verse 28, a couple of verses after um, Peter uh, acknowledges Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus tells them, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And this is, again, a reference to Daniel 
chapter 7, where in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has a vision about someone that is like the Son of Man that is brought um, close to God and ultimately given dominion over all its enemies. And again, this is in the, in the context of the future Messianic era. Matthew 24, verse 34. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Matthew 24 is where Jesus is speaking to a crowd and telling them about things that are going to happen in the future. Things are going to happen in the end time. And he's saying, we're right here right now. It's going to happen now. But we have a problem. What's the problem? The problem is that Jesus is crucified without anything happening. What do I mean without anything happening? What I mean is all these promises that are spoken of in the Jewish scriptures about a utopia that's going to come and that will have a leader that serves as the catalyst for this change, none of that comes about. And Jesus is crucified like a common criminal. And so the hope of the first followers of Jesus are shattered. Again, we need to understand that the, the New Testament paints the followers of Jesus as not understanding Jesus' messages about him having to suffer and die. And I can understand why they wouldn't understand, because that's not what we get from the Jewish scriptures. And so what happens? What happens ultimately is that when you have your... Um, your beliefs challenged and you start to feel very uncomfortable with what you're believing, you need to do something to accommodate these changes to be able to remove the dissonance. And this is a theory that was uh, coined by somebody named uh, Leon Festinger who spoke about something called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. And it is possible that what happened for the followers of Jesus is as they walking away from the cross as they're seeing him dead they're asking themselves so well, what's going to be with all our hopes they didn't want to give up those hopes and I can understand that I wouldn't want to give up those hopes either and so what you want to try and do is come up with some kind of explanation about how God's plan is going to actually still continue, that it's not being derailed. Imagine you've invested so much in something and you encounter a glitch. What you want to do is say, okay, it's not the end of the world. I can still go on with this. I can still go on with this plan. There's so much still here at stake. And that's what they do. They believe that Jesus is going to come back. He's going to come back. And therefore, we can still hold on to this hope that Jesus will still take us out of this miserable um, occupation from uh, the Romans. Now, is that a problem for Judaism? Is it a problem for Jewish people to believe that someone will be resurrected and will serve as a leader, serve as the Messiah? So, there are many that would say, yes, it's certainly a problem. It's a huge problem. We as Judaism believe in only one coming. We don't believe in two comings. And somebody who dies, that disqualifies him. And that's the end of the story. However, it's not so simple. It's not so simple. Although it may not be viewed as normative, but nevertheless, we do know that Daniel in chapter 12 speaks about a time when the Jewish people will be resurrected. There'll be a resurrection of the dead. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. This idea is also spoken about in Ezekiel. And so therefore, it's not completely outside of the pale of Judaism to speak about people being resurrected. And when it comes to what exactly is going to happen and how it will all play out, there is room for a bit of ambiguity. The Bible doesn't lay out step by step how the redemption will take place. So, although it might not be normative, but nevertheless, it still can be considered within the realms of a possible hope for a Jewish person to believe that someone has died, but God will choose to raise them 
and that they could then lead as the Messiah. It's possible. However, time passes. A generation passes. Many of the first followers of Jesus are now dead. They've passed away. And so the followers, the believers, are starting to ask themselves, what's with our hope? We believe that Jesus is coming back, but he hasn't come back. And a generation has passed, and people have passed away. And what you'll see in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, is that Paul has to deal with this. Paul, remember, is writing around the year 50, and he's writing to people who are dealing with this challenge to their faith that nothing has changed, they're still under this brutal occupation, and uh, really, it's business as usual. Nothing's changing. So he says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. He doesn't want his followers, those who he's uh, ministering to, to give up their hope in Jesus, to give up their hope in this future uh, redemption. And so therefore, he's trying to tell them that... uh, Verse, four, uh, verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. What's interesting to note in this verse is Paul seems to believe that it's going to happen in his lifetime. He thinks that Jesus is coming back in his lifetime. And so until more than a generation, two generations pass, Everything is still on track, but then the next generation grows up and there's nothing there and they're left with a very, very, very uncomfortable question. And that question is, if Jesus is coming back and at the time that he comes back, he's going to bring about this incredible change to the world that we're all looking forward to. Why did he need to show up a hundred years ago and be crucified like a common criminal. What's the point of that? Who needed Jesus to come the first time around if everything that he's going to do is only going to happen the second time around? That's a very, very strong question. And so, what really began the parting of the ways between Judaism and Christianity is when a particular change had to come in to be able to deal with this difficult question. And that was, perhaps the role of the Messiah isn't just to bring in a future utopia. Perhaps there's another very, very significant role that the Messiah plays. What's that role? That role is to die for the sins of the world. That in order for us to have a relationship with God, we need to have a Messiah who comes and dies for our sin. Now you may think that perhaps that's something we should consider. What's so wrong with that? Well, apart from there being absolutely no scriptural support for such a concept, What do I mean by that? When I say there's no scriptural support for that concept, what I mean is there's nowhere in the scriptures that speaks about a future Davidic king that will come and rule that is to first die and suffer for our sins. There is no such passage. There is no such passage that speaks about a future Davidic king that dies and suffers for the sins of the world. And that's clear. Besides for that, what happens is that in the wake of this assumption or assertion that a Messiah comes to die for the sins of the world, what happens is we are automatically dealt a whole new series of questions. What do I mean? When I come along and I tell you that someone has come to die for your sins, The first question is, why do I need somebody to die for my sins? That's ridiculous. 
Last week, we had a whole presentation on how one can navigate their way back to God after sinning. And it's clear in the scriptures that the way to navigate your way back to God is by doing exactly that, returning to God. And God makes it very clear in many, many places that if you seek God with a sincere heart, you humble yourself and you return to obeying what God has asked of you, that's the way back to God. So what then happens is, in order to be able to still hold on to a notion that a Messiah has to die for your sin, what has to happen is, I need to negate the possibility of you being able to actually get right with God yourself. And so, that's exactly what the Christian scriptures end up doing. Paul, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 21 says, If righteousness could come through following the Torah, then Christ died in vain. What that means is, as far as Paul is concerned, it is not possible to follow the law. It's not possible. Now you see, this idea that you cannot follow the law, is there to be able to help us justify Jesus' death. Do you, do you see the connection? He, he connects it quite plainly over here. If the righteousness could come through following the Torah, then Christ died in vain. Jesus would not have to have died if we could keep the Torah. Well, what do we know from the Torah? We know from the Torah that we can keep it. Deuteronomy chapter 30 Verse 11 through 14, this is in reference 17 over here. It says, now what I'm commanding you today, this is Moses speaking, is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. God tells us through Moses in the scriptures that it is possible to keep the commandments. And so here what happens is, not only do we start to have different views about the role of the Messiah. But what happens is, and remember the, the title of the lecture tonight is The Domino Effect. Once you hit one domino, once you start to change one thing in Judaism, then there are consequences, and those consequences, who knows where they end? Because watch what happens. You, you start with redefining the role of the Messiah to be able to accommodate your hope, and then you have to start to redefine the notion of commandments and whether, or whether it's possible to follow the commandments of God. And then what happens is, then what happens is that a person is told they cannot keep the commandments and therefore they need to have a sacrifice and the sacrifice is the death of Jesus, right? You ask yourself the question, well, why specifically Jesus? Why did Jesus have to die? We have so many thousands, if not millions, of other people who died at the hands of the Romans and people before them and people after them. Why, does it, why is the death of Jesus so significant? What happens then is, we have a whole new world that opens up, and that is Jesus wasn't just an ordinary person. Jesus was actually sinless, and the sacrifice needs to be sinless. The one that's going to serve as a sacrifice to atone for your sins needs to be sinless. Jesus was sinless? But doesn't the Bible say that there's no one that is sinless? Ah, this is where we come to another change. And that is Jesus wasn't a human. He wasn't like me and you. He was actually God incarnate. He was the second member of the triune Godhead. And so God had to send himself into the world in order to be able to sacrifice himself, in order to be able to have your sins forgiven, 
And that's the function of the Messiah. And so the problem we have, the problem we have is that from going from a righteous Davidic king who comes to transform the world, we ultimately end up with a God born of a virgin who comes to die for the sins of the world. That's a radical departure. That's a radical departure from the notion of the Messiah that we have in the Jewish scriptures. Now, the question is, what about the followers of Jesus? The first followers of Jesus. Did they subscribe to these ideas? Did they subscribe to these doctrines? Well, what we have from the New Testament itself are two very, very interesting passages. In Acts chapter 15, we're told about the council that took place in Jerusalem that gathered together to deal with a very, very interesting question that they had. You see, today we take it for granted that Christians, followers of Jesus, are non-Jewish. And when we hear about a Jewish follower of Jesus, Jesus, we're all surprised. We're all in shock. What? A Jewish follower of Jesus. But in the first century in Palestine, what happened was for a Gentile to be considered a follower of Jesus was out of the ordinary. And so they had to deal with the question of whether or not a Gentile that wanted to follow Jesus had to go through conversion, had to embrace all the commandments and go through circumcision like anybody who wanted to convert to Judaism in that time. And at that council, they ultimately decided that there was no need for a Gentile to adopt all of the commandments or to go through circumcision. But what they would have to follow are some of the universal Noahide laws um, that God had intended for all of mankind. What is incredibly um, insightful in this passage is, and for this you need to have a little bit of a Gemara cup, as they say, goes like this. If they're discussing about Gentiles and asking the question whether they need to keep the law in order to follow Jesus, what does that say about what they thought about themselves? Of course they need to keep the commandments. It's without, it goes without saying that they felt that they have to. If they didn't believe that they need to follow the commandments, then the whole council wouldn't have taken place. They wouldn't have been having this discussion about Gentiles having to keep the law. And then we go to Acts 21, where we read that um, this is when Paul came back to Jerusalem and there was uh, this whole meeting and many of the people were very upset with Paul, very, very angry with Paul, because they were hearing rumors that Paul was going around in the diaspora teaching people against the law of Moses. And they were very upset about it. And so it says, it says over here in Acts 21, 21, they have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to, the, to our customs. They were incensed. And in fact, in that passage, it talks about followers of Jesus who were zealous for the law. Pharisees, they, they speak of over there. What this tells us is, years after the death of Jesus, none of the followers of Jesus assumed that they don't have to keep the law. In fact, I'll tell you something interesting. In this passage, in Acts 21, in order to be able to prove to the council that Paul had not forsaken the way of Moses, they require him to make a demonstration um, that he's actually still faithful to Moses and to the commandments. And what do they ask him to do? They ask him to pay for the sacrifices of people who had come to the end of their time of growing their hair. We know in Judaism, in the book of Numbers, it speaks about Nazarites, people who take upon themselves an oath to grow their hair and to refrain from drinking any wine. And at the end of the period, they were told to bring a sacrifice. 
In Numbers chapter, chapter 6, we're told that that sacrifice was actually a sin sacrifice. So what's interesting is, over here is the followers of Jesus are telling Paul that you need to pay for sin sacrifices years after the death of Jesus. What does that tell us? What that tells us is that the followers of Jesus had no notion whatsoever about Jesus coming to die for their sins and abolishing the sacrificial system once and for all. But on the contrary, they still believed that Jesus wanted them to keep on going in the way of the commandments of the Torah and to continue within Judaism. The only difference between them and other Jews would have been whether or not they anticipated Jesus to be the one to come and redeem the Jewish people in the future. What happens centuries later? In the second century, we have um, a group of Jews who still believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and they were known as the Ebionites. And what we read about uh, from Irenaeus is that these Ebionites, they use the gospel according to Matthew only, which means they do not accept any of the other gospels. They repudiate the apostle Paul, I wonder why. Maintaining that he was an apostate from the law. We're told that this group of followers of Jesus that lived in the second century practice circumcision, preserve an observance of the customs which are enjoined in the law and are so Judaic in their lifestyle of life that they even adore Jerusalem as if it were the house of God. So what that tells us is that the church is starting to split in a major way with a few Jews remaining loyal to their Judaism, but the majority of the church shifting radically away. Eusebius, who is a church historian, tells us about these Ebionites, saying that they did not believe in the virgin birth, they did not believe in the Trinity, they kept the Torah, and they followed the Hebrew gospel of, Math uh, of Matthew, and they rejected Paul. And so what happens over time is not only does the church, the Pauline church, drift away from Judaism, they end up persecuting the original group of Jewish followers of Jesus. They try to stamp them out. They consider them heretics because they don't accept the Trinity, because they don't accept the virgin birth, because they still maintain a loyalty to the law of Moses and to the Jewish people. And so we ultimately end up in the 4th century with uh, somebody named St. John Chrysostom who writes the following. The Jews sacrifice their children to Satan. They are worse than wild beasts. The synagogue is a brothel, a den of scoundrels, the temple of demons devoted to idolatrous cults, a criminal assembly of Jews, a place of meeting for, this, for the assassins of Christ, a house of ill fame, a dwelling of iniquity, a gulf, an abyss of perdition. The Jews have fallen into a condition worse than the vilest animal. It is the duty of all Christians to hate the Jews. And so when we move so far, from a group of Jews living in Jerusalem who were loyal to the Torah, who believed in the keeping of the commandments, to a group of people who are not Jewish, living outside the land of Israel, who um, despise even Jewish followers of Jesus and become rabid anti-Semites, we are very, very, very far away from the original group that followed Jesus. I was debating whether or not to discuss tonight something that I have been speaking about on my Facebook over the past 24 hours. The reason why I, I'm hesitating to, uh, to bring it up is because my intention is not to label all Christians as anti-Semites or to justify anybody who uses passages from the New Testament to vilify Jews. But nevertheless, it is important for 
us to recognize that European anti-Semitism did not grow in a vacuum. It's not something that popped up out of the blue. European anti-Semitism, I would argue, is very much rooted in the texts of the New Testament, the way they have been read over centuries and the way they were taught throughout their communities. It is by no coincidence that the Holocaust <coughs> did not only contain murderers from Germany. There were people from every background, every uh, nationality that took part in murdering Jews. It didn't come as a surprise to them to view Jewish people as subhuman. Where did that come from? You want to know where it came from? It came from this notion that Jews, by their mere rejection of Jesus, are so intrinsically evil and vile that they need to be hated. Unfortunately, that message has been around for so long that it is really, really, really difficult to uproot. And so when I saw that this Robert Bauer had prominently posted on his internet profile John chapter 8, 44, which referred to the Jewish people as children of the devil, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't surprised. Does that mean I think that every Christian that reads the book of John is going to pick up a gun and walk into synagogues? Not at all. There are very decent people in the church. There are very decent Christians that are I consider friends of mine and neighbors. I'm not saying that Christians are going to do that. But what I am saying is that the texts of the New Testament have a very bloody history. And more needs to be done to challenge the way these texts are understood by Christians. When a Jew is pointed to as somebody who rejects Jesus, Christians ought to be telling their children that Jewish people reject Jesus because they believe that that is what God wants them to do. It is because they love God that they reject Jesus. It's okay for Christians not to agree with us. And it's okay for us not to agree with Christians. It's okay for us to have different points of views. But once I start attributing motives to another group that doesn't agree with me, that ultimately leads to dehumanizing that person. And so when Christians read in their scriptures about Jewish people rejecting Jesus, what they're not hearing in the Christian scriptures is how these people actually love God and believe that it is their duty to reject doctrines which they believe contrary to what the Bible teaches. And so what I'd like to conclude with tonight is um, a message to all of us that we need to judge other people favorably. We need to think of people in the best possible light. And we need to speak of them in that way. The reason why we need to speak about them in that way is because the more you speak positively about somebody, the more they become positive, the more they will try to live up to that uh, characterization. However, if we speak negatively about people, it just has a, a, a negative effect and it ultimately leads to stereotyping, racism, and ultimately prejudice and persecution of people that are different to us. Thank you for coming.